creeps and grave hunters welcome to another history rant um clearly you guys can see i have redecorated the space a bit it is now officially spooky season for us that love halloween it's always spooky season but i feel like especially this year it's absolutely appropriate to celebrate it right now i like to change the set every episode but this one is full-blown like victorian meets halloween i got the sleeves going i attempted a victorian hairstyle I don't know if it's working. I'm probably gonna regret it later, honestly, and I'm sweating to death. But anyways, before we continue on with the video, go ahead and slide ah! that like button. Help me with the algorithm, and then I hope by now you guys know the drill. If you want today's cocktail recipe, you have already gone to my TikTok or my Instagram. I have listened to you guys. Not everybody has a TikTok. I personally don't even understand how to use it. So if you don't have one, I don't blame you. So now the cocktail recipe is also on Instagram. This, my friends, this is the French 1897, my own creation. It's got homemade lavender syrup, champagne, blackberries, lemon twist. It is spicy. It is the perfect cocktail to talk about. The 1897 Parisian Paris charity bizarre fire this will also be the episode where i attempt to say french words and slaughter them i am sorry i do not speak french i really want to speak french i was in paris last year i kept trying to speak french it was a fail they laughed at me it wasn't good so forgive me in advance i might just not even attempt it but maybe i will let's see how much i drink anyways on with the show chin chin First, we have to like understand what Paris in 1897 was like. Like this is post-revolution, all right? Like the monarchy and nobility technically like shouldn't be a thing, except it, like it is. Like in the 19th century, you have like five different kings slash like emperors and all of them created their own like nobility. So you have this growing number of nobility and aristocrats. To this day, to give you perspective, to this day, over 100,000 people in France consider themselves inherited nobility because usually nobility is inherited. There is some leniency there. Um, but so if it's 100,000 today, imagine what it was in 1897. And also they're still kind of adhering to their uh, three like tiered system, which was really common in like Catholic Europe, but it was really kind of like killing it in France and essentially it's like a three estate system. The top you have well like the monarchy originally they're all spicy and sexy and you know love it until they're super dead um, and then you have the Catholic clergy which make up the first estate. Then underneath them you have the nobility second estate and then the third estate is peasants. Nobody. You and me. <laughs> oh what I'm getting at is that in 1897, Paris is still very much controlled by the church, very spicy in the aristocracy. And they kind of get this idea like, oh, we're super fancy. Uh, let's throw a charity bazaar so we can like sell things and then we can use those proceeds for our favorite charities. And we get to say we're like do-gooders. And also like, ooh, here's an interesting idea. Let's have our wives, I'm speaking from male arist ar aristocrats right now. Let's have our wives like man the cute little booths so people can like gawk at our women and like if they married into the aristocracy and their woman's all spicy, like look at me, I leveled up and maybe, maybe I'm single, maybe I'm looking for a match. So honestly, let's just be honest. These bazaars were for charity, but more than anything else, it was kind of like a giant schmooze fest. So like, you know, come here, buy things, donate to charity by buying things and then like maybe you leave with a wife. So the May 3rd, 1897 bazaar was no exception to this. So Henri Blanc, <laughs> it's Henry Blount is how I want to pronounce it. Is it Henri Blount? I don't know. I don't speak French. Somebody help me. Anyways, he's the son of like this important noble, Sir Edward Blount. <laughs> Where do you cut the word off? I don't know French. He has this idea for this like great tent and that's what the bazaar will be. It'll be a medieval tent. We're gonna go back to Paris in the medieval times. So let's let's construct 
this beautiful tent made of like cheap pine wood. Let's cover it with a tar painted canvas because that doesn't spell trouble. And inside there's a carpenter's pit, but that's fine. We'll just cover it with a, like a flimsy plywood plywood flooring with like some sawdust. I don't think there was sawdust, but that's why I'm picturing my mind. And let's have paintings and murals and let's set it up like it's a Paris medieval village. So like there's little houses that are the booths and it's not very big. It's like 260 feet long, only 62 feet wide. Um, you know, what could go wrong? Oh, also the little houses inside that all the booths are made of are literally made of cardboard and paper mache. And to light the beautiful tent, uh, is a giant gas-filled balloon. And you know, they had some spicy things there. It wasn't just women selling wares. Um, they also were showcasing like Paris's many achievements and industry and like, here's our machinery. And also, oh my God, guys, have you seen what's over here? That's a cinematograph, a, cinem a cinematograph, a cinema, an early camera, an early projector film camera, okay? playing short films, it's magic, get your tickets, come on in, it's gonna be great, you're not gonna die. Also, that cinematograph, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, but anyways, it's the way it runs with ether and oxygen, not combustible elements at all. So it's May 4th, it's the second day of the bazaar, the first day went off without a hitch, it was a great time, everybody loved it. Henri Blanc is like, hell yes, I'm a goddamn genius. And it's the second day. There's 1,800 people in attendance. Um, it's on fire. Not yet. Pretty much most of the people that are there are women and children. And you know, like I've said before, this was a schmooze fest. It was really a networking event. A lot of the women were sent by their husbands. They're like wealthy aristocratic husbands that were like, I need you to go show face, go there, bid on something, spend a lot of money, make me look good, blah, 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 blah. Um, so women kind of begrudgingly went there. They had to wear their nicest clothing because this is like the event of the year. Americans and Europeans are also there. Like people come all around to go there, see these women, maybe make a match, maybe see the newest fashions. It's Paris people. It's Paris people. So everybody's going there to get fancy. So it's women and children and they're like assistants and they're nannies pretty much. Like that's who's wandering about. And you know, these dresses, these outfits are not comfortable. They are bulky. They're hard to maneuver in. Um, but like cry about it later, Colette, because beauty is pain. Okay. And you look fabulous. So keep on going with your corset itself. Um, but also like the beauty standards of the day, there's a lot of dry shampoo and like petroleum based hair lotions that are totally flammable when introduced to heat too closely. Um, so you have all of that going on with the scattering of men. Just like a, like a little, like a little sprinkling on top of the ice cream sandwich of women. And there's also some like pretty important people there. Like you have the favorite sister of the Empress of Austria is in attendance. You have the Spanish consul of Paris's wife there. You have like uh, fancy uh, dermatologists. You have all sorts of people with names that I can't pronounce and I don't want to embarrass myself folks but the point I'm trying to make here the most important thing is that this was a big deal things are going to go south very very like freakishly fast at this event but I'm gonna need more champagne really quick don't worry about it because I'm about to talk about some hardcore death okay oh god so you have the cinematograph that's how I'm gonna say it. I don't care. Don't comment me, guys. I'm just, I'm just gonna do my best, okay? I've had a pot of champagne. Anyways, moving on, moving on. Um, with this camera projector, Shabuzi, on um, this oxy-etheric situation, you have the operator, this dude named Victor, and you have his assistant, this guy named Greg, Gregor, Gregor. So, they are doing their little magic, making the motion pictures happen. And the people are like loving it. They're like, oh my God, these pictures are moving. What's next? A telephone? Was a telephone invented yet? Something happens as in the oxy lamp went out 
And Victor's like, oh my God, Gregor, you gotta do it. You gotta fix it, hurry, 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 hurry. Because the audience is gonna be in darkness. So do the little magic really quick so we can get the pictures rolling again because people can't know there's a problem. All of this is happening behind a curtain. Think Wizard of Oz. Think the Wizard and Wizard of Oz, okay? Nobody can see this. They're just having a gay old time, probably drinking some champagne. I don't know the science behind how these things work. All I know there is like a tube of ether um, oxygen, obviously, and all this science magic, whatever happens. And they put it together. There's a shutter situation and Gregor goes and flicks the match and it goes boof because the ether had leaked into the atmosphere and just erupted, erupted and it caught the drapes on fire and things go from like zero to 60 in a matter of 10 minutes. Like the majority of the damage happened in 10 minutes. So these people in this small little thing, because a little curtain goes up pretty fast, start yelling fire, 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 obviously. But people on the other end can't see the fire. So they're just kind of hearing like, what's, what? Marie, what are you saying? Fire, there's no fire. I'm looking at this beautiful trinket over here. And then all of a sudden, a stampede comes, okay? People are freaking out. I would freak out. Somebody yells fire. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run, okay? So everybody starts running towards the entrance, the one entrance, the main entrance. But so many people go that people topple, they fall. Obviously, it's pandemonium. So people are getting trampled to death, okay? This is like superstar. This is Mary Catherine Gallagher levels things. They're getting trampled to death, and like there's literally witness accounts that were there that survived that talk about like literally being lifted off their feet by the crowd. It was like this moving mass. Now, this is an important fact. There were, there was a one main entrance. There was seven exits, none of which were clearly marked and a majority of them with doors that opened inwards. So you can imagine if you have a crowd of people that are rushing towards it, trying to pull or trying to push to get out, it's not working. So people literally, burn up because they are getting stuck in an areas where they literally don't know how to figure out how to get out the door or the crowd around them is so intense and pushing so much they can't move back to pull it open it's absolutely tragic i mean there's literally accounts of people seeing because remember that tar draped canvas yeah, that started to leak, okay? That tar fell on the women and what was in their hair. Very flammable products. So these women's faces are literally being covered and burning off. Like we are talking about women that are faceless. There's just bloody faces running. These giant dresses the women are wearing, sometimes their underpants, like literally up in their skirt would be on fire, but their, their skirt on the outside wasn't. So they're constantly like ripping off layers. Like people talk about their clothes literally being torn from their bodies just to smother flames or to give any kind of protection. People talk about the sound of the crackling of the flames inside the body. And yeah, sure, some people get out, they run in the street, they're yelling, fire, fire, fire. The neighboring hotel is like helping pull bars off the like the pit's windows to get people out and trying to create cracks. Um, firemen rush to the scene, police rush to the scene, people are coming around, people will run in to try to help, but then the fire gets worse, they run back out, there's accounts of women that got out, but then they're like, oh shit, where's my daughter? They run back in because they don't know where their daughter is, they think they're still in there. And then when the firemen get there, and then when people think it might be safe or like help is here, the roof collapses. And there's so many, I urge you guys to look up the actual like written accounts of like things that were said about what people heard and saw. But the upshot was um, the human torches as they called it um, and the sea of grief and moaning and screaming went very quiet. So imagine a burning inferno and it's just, unbelievable screams for help and pain and then a huge horrible ruckus of a roof collapsing and then silence that is what people witnessed um 
in 30 minutes, in 30 minutes, like this all happened half past four. So 4.30, by five o'clock, there was nothing left. And when I mean there's nothing left, I mean all the materials they used to build the bazaar were gone. Like, at, like there was no twisted iron. There was none of that. None of that existed because this was only meant to stand for four days. So they didn't have huge intense materials. The largest standing mass, because it was just a black ash field, the largest standing monument was the pile of bodies of people by the front door trying to get out. People were so charred that there was almost nothing at all recognizable about any of these people, which is so, so tragic to think about. Like most people, if there was anything left, had to be identified by dental records. So by six o'clock, obviously the word is spread like crazy. You could see the flames. There's nothing very tall in Paris. This fire would have been pretty apparent. Um, so you have a ton of people there, journalists, people looking for loved ones, onlookers, and people getting trophies. But pretty much, yeah, Ashfield, there's not much left. Some people were identified by jewelry, other people, like there were accounts of people that are like half burned. So there was still some clothing on the part of their corpse that wasn't completely burned. And they were identified that way. But in total, about 126 people died. Now, given the fact that there was 1800 people in attendance, yeah, I mean, hundreds more were injured. Uh, but still, considering those were pretty much all children and women, important women, rich women, and I don't mean to say that only rich people are important. I'm just saying in France at this time to have a bunch of like noble women essentially killed is crazy. Oh, also, this is a fun little fact. So yeah, most things were burnt up in the fire, but some few little trinkets remained. So anything that didn't get absolutely destroyed in the fire was put up for auction, except for any kind of like brochures advertising it, which is very strange to me. But oddly enough, the item that went for the highest amount that sold for the most amount of money was absolutely the most macabre item they had. I don't even know why they were selling this, except of course I do. It's Victorian times. People love this stuff. The highest selling item was an earring with a little bit of charred flesh still attached. I would have bought it. So everybody wants to blame somebody for this. Obviously, I would want to blame somebody for this. The first person people start to accuse is the charity committee president, this guy named Ange Ferdinand. Again, I promise you guys I'm saying it wrong, but whatever. Uh, they blamed him because the dude is like responsible for overseeing the whole thing. And people are like, hey man, you have this whole giant flammable experience and you had no firemen on site. You had no intense access to water on the street. You didn't have like properly marked exits. And then of course, naturally they're gonna blame the people with the, cinemat the, cin the cinemagraph. Uh, Victor and Gregor. Um, and ultimately, they were kind of all actually uh, charged with murder by negligence. Basically, they were all fined. Victor and Gregor, Gregor, whatever. Uh, they did serve some jail time, but less than a year. I don't think Ange Ferdinand served any time, which is BS. This is a super horrible thing that happened and I didn't know about it. Like I went to Paris and I didn't see anything talking about it. And this is a city where like, there's still the grooves where like the city guillotine is in the middle of the road, okay? I love Paris, my God, I love Paris. I wish I had known about this when I went there, so I go visit the site. Obviously, you guys know about it. You voted for it. So thank you so much for bringing it to my attention. And we should be talking about this. Like this event, as tragic as it was, is a prime example of how it took this horrible thing happening for France to really start to take safety measures for buildings and events. Like this is the catalyst that ushered in most of their safety things. 
So unfortunately, history has always proven that there always needs to be that one thing that makes us be like, oh, we need to not do that because a lot of people just died and we don't want people to die. So yeah, guys, talk about the 1897 Paris Charity Bazaar. There's a really sexy French way to say that. I won't be that person to do it for you. I would ruin it for you. Thank you guys so much for tuning into another History Rants. I love that you guys voted. I love that you guys are enjoying these. I'm having a blast making them. So if you enjoy it, please don't forget to slot the like button, hit subscribe, follow me on Instagram, follow me on TikTok. Let's be buddies and rant about history together and keep your suggestions coming because I'm also learning something while teaching everybody else something. So chin chin creeps. <laughs>